Wow. Yeah. What was it like being in the military when 9-11 went down? It was like, uh, I think everyone there. So we're, there's a group of us in this building at Fort Bragg called the SOAV, the Special Operations Academic Facility. And we're, you know, standing around the beginning of the day, like drinking coffee, getting ready to go to class. First day of class. And there's television monitors on with CNN or whatever. And you, we're watching the planes go into the tower. And, like, I think to a one, everyone knew that everything's changing right now. It's like, this is, like, 100% for real. And, like, everyone was like, yeah. <laughs> you know? That's how you felt? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. All the training. Yeah. Like, finally, we're going to do something. Mm-hmm. So what happens then? Uh, I'm in language school for another six months. So what are you learning? Uh, Thai. Why Thai? It's just like my my unit's uh, area of responsibility was Asia, so I had to do an Asian language, and I like Thai food. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, graduate the Q course, like do a couple of J sets in Asia. So J sets, uh, joint combined uh, exchange training. So you basically go, your team goes and trains with a foreign uh, special operations unit and you, you teach them stuff or you, you know, it, and it's more just to like establish rapport and uh, maybe get some access or whatever. So do a couple of J sets in Asia and then uh, get ready to go to Iraq uh, to prep for the invasion, like an O2 and like spend a lot of time in Kuwait, just like training and pre- getting preparing. What was it like when you went there? To Iraq? Yeah. So that that was like my first like combat experience. And so it was unique in that so my team and a couple other teams are basically attached to um the fourth ID to provide kind of route reconnaissance and screening and stuff for the kind of this main a uh, conventional military, you know, <laughs> invasion. And so watching watching big army work, you know, do do what they do best was pretty amazing. Like uh like tank engagements, like I never thought I'd witness that. Um it, it was just almost like a and it's probably a, a trite cliche but like a movie, you know watching this massive mechanized force just like crush everything in its path. So, yeah. When you were over there was any doubt that you had done the right thing by enlisting and oh, again? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt at all. Yeah. You were geared up ready to go. Yeah. So what happened when you were over there? Uh d- like got in some gunfights, <laughs> you know, uh hit some targets. Um, and then, you know, redeployed back to the States. You say that so casually, gotten gunfights and hit some targets. Like it had to be a pretty extreme experience. Yeah. But honestly, I I think my Afghan experiences were more intense than Iraq for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it was a different animal. And when did that happen? So did, uh, some rotations in Afghanistan following, uh, the Iraq invasion, and it was kind of the more traditional, like, SF mission, like, working with indigenous troops and and leading them on, on raids and things like that. That's got to be a wild change of life to go from being a musician, to go from being a deployed special operator in Afghanistan. Like, the shift in consciousness is so extreme. <laughs> maybe maybe but I, I i i think i'm pretty good at just with rolling with stuff you know it's like oh this is happening now okay but that's but a big go. happening <laughs> it's a huge happening yeah. to um, be in combat i mean definitely i think the war in in combat was the most profound experience of my life for sure and and i i don't mean to maybe treat it lightly cuz i don't take it lightly yeah, it's f- by far the most profound experience of my life. So many guys who come back from that, 
not only do they say it's the most profound experience of their life, but many of them say it was the best experience of their life. Um, I understand that for sure. Like, uh, I guess I can encapsulate it like this. Like you, you got, you got your, your dudes, you know, your, your, your team, your, your little indigenous troopers, and you're going to go crush some target. And, you know, you, you know, like I never had a doubt that, um, like maybe I would get injured or killed, but that the, that the, I never had a doubt that the mission would fail just cause the, the odds were just in our favor. You know, it's like, you got night vision, you got a, a, a cast stack, you got this huge support apparatus. It's like, there's no way we're not going to win this fight. Um, but, but going on target, closing with destroying the enemy and then getting you and all your dudes back to base alive, best feeling in the world. Really? Yeah. So uh, many guys say that best feeling in the world. Wow. Yeah. What is it like? What can you describe it? <laughs> I, I, it's, um, or give an attempt. I, I, I think, like, and I got my uh, kind of evolutionary ideas about why that is. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we're, we're on a very essential level, like doing what human beings or one of the things we're meant to do. Or m maybe one of the things we've always done. Well, we're an adversarial species, but like every species in nature is adversarial mm -hmm. you know and it, it's not an evaluative state evaluative statement it's just kind of a, an observation so i think on this just the way our brains are like uh, evolutionarily like okay we're, we're the monkeys with the big brains right mm -hmm. and we've created this very technologically um advanced if not challenging environment now that we live in but the way our, our firmware up here, we're still hominids on the savanna, you know, like 100%. And so I, th I think through through war, through combat, we kind of tap into that primal, okay, this is what we're supposed to do, you know. And Was that surprising to have that part of your mind sort of ignited? In, in a sense where you realize that like, this is like something that's deeply embedded in your DNA? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know I'm making that claim, but it's, 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 it's not based on like scientific research I've done. It's just kind of an uh, intuition. Well, many, many make that claim. Yeah. It's, it's not an uncommon thought. Yeah. So it, it, it rings true to me. And like, uh, have you read like uh, that Seb Sebastian Younger book, yes. Tribe? Yeah. Great so, book. Yeah. I, and like his thesis, like that's the first kind of PTSD thesis I read that kind of rang true with me. Because like before that, the popular conception was, you know, the, these young men and women go off to war and see horrible things and come back fucked up. But like his thesis where they, they lose that lose that tribe, right? That task and purpose, uh, unity of effort. You know, literally, we're, we're, we're tribal creatures. Like, yeah. that's, that's what we, that's how we operate. Like, I, I, I did a paper when I was doing my undergrad. Um, I think I was trying to investigate, like, uh, genetic impetus for, like, human conflict or whatever. And, like, some, one of the, during my research, one of the things I found that was super interesting to me was the way, uh, psychologically, we're equipped to deal with about 100 to 120 individuals. Like that 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 would be our extended tribe, our social group. Dunbar's number. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's um, this group of people that you can contain in your mind. Yeah. And, there, and it, it's segmented. There's like a, a small number of people that you're intimately attached to. There's a, a larger number that are close, but more like associates and mm -hmm. friends. And then there's people that you know, and it extends out. It actually extends even further than 120 or 150. It gets to, like, people you are aware of. But yeah. it's it's fairly small, which is one of the weird things about knowing a lot of people. Yeah. So that, that number gets really weird, and then your, your memory of people, it's almost like your brain deletes them because there's no room. Like, but then, it, like, how well do you know them as right. well? You know, right. Like, how, how intimate is that relationship? 
so the, an interesting correlation I made, like researching this paper, was that that number is is the same number um, in Army Task Organization as an infantry company mm. is 120, and that's kind of like you know, you, you know your main operational unit as, as a in the infantry at, at least. Like soft, you're dealing with smaller teams, smaller mm. numbers. But I, I thought, wow, 120. That's it. Mm. You know, and is that by design or is that just the way it worked out? It's probably it goes back to our tribal roots, mm -hmm. most likely, that we evolved being uh, accustomed to that group of people, that number of people or a similar number. Yeah, I mean, just survival. Like, uh, like our, our mission statement is biological organisms, uh, you know, e even like the big brain monkeys that we are. It's like, like s survive and replicate the gene. Yeah, and like everything else is kind of window dressing, you know. Right. It's like, yeah, and like you, you, you can window dress it however you want to make it seem more important than that. But and my, I'm I'm a huge fan of the window dressing. Like like that's definitely the the salt in the soup for sure. Mm -hmm. But if you boil it down to you know it's you know what is the quiddity of being a human being? It's that or any biological organism, like survive and, and replicate the gene. And so the, the whole capacity for, for combat, for human warfare, is like, even as an individual, if, if you're killed in combat, on, on, if you go back to like this group of hominids on the savanna, you're probably related to everyone in your group. So it's like, okay, maybe I won't pass my genes on, but my cousin over here will. So mm. I'm going to support that effort. So I think that kind of organized um, conflict, one group against another, is in support of that. Like I think anthropologists have a term for it, um, a pseudo kinship, where in, say in a combat situation, so you got like the the classic uh, scenario of like a, a dude jumping on a hand grenade to save his buddies, mm -hmm. you know, and that's like. That's hardwired. That's not a conscious decision, mm -hmm. you know, because I think if if you had time to actually think about it, maybe you wouldn't do it, right? You know, but it's that that pseudo kinship, like uh, that. I think that's and to me, that's always what's been I think the most interesting paradox about war and combat is it's this event, this human event that simultaneously brings about acts of pure selfless love and brutality without quarter in the same instant. Mm. So that, that's always intrigued me. Well, it's always fascinating for me to talk to people that are intelligent like yourself that have experienced that because that, that thread that you're, exp you're expressing, it seems to ring true with almost all, all of them that there's, there's something about it that although brutal and maybe in, in some ways unexpected, it also rings true with like a purpose and that your life is intimately connected to these people and in some way that becomes more satisfying than any other way to live. 